Romans chapter 7, we'll continue our study there. And for our visitors, we've been studying the book of Romans, and we're coming to the end of chapter 7 today. Previously, we discussed how the struggle of one who tries to serve God faithfully, and you find yourself doing things you don't want to do, and find yourself not doing things you do want to do, all right? But we must remember that it is the new man within us, he desires to serve God, but that old man that remains, that sinful nature, if you will, it desires still to follow all those sins and wickedness. Right. Paul is kind of coming to the conclusion of this discussion here in verse 21 to the end of the chapter, where he says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Right. He begins by saying here, I find them a law, or there's a, a principle or a fact, if you will, that and he comes to this conclusion after he described the, the Christian struggle, and he says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Mm -hmm. and when he wants to do good, when he tries to do that which is right, he finds that evil is there, that sinfulness is there with him, that it is there ready to raise its ugly head at any moment, at any given opportunity, sin is there ready to hinder us in our walk with God, and Right. Impede us in our service for Christ. I think we see examples of that even in the scriptures. I think David's probably maybe a more extreme example of this, but he was a man after God's own heart, yet we know that he fell to what we would think is very big sins. Right. Committing adultery with Bathsheba and then having her husband killed in battle. And it wasn't until Nathan the prophet came and called him out on that he really recognize his sin. Amen. But we do the same type of things, don't we? If we are truly trying to serve God, we find ourselves not doing things we ought to do and doing things we ought not to do. That is the struggle that any faithful servant of God will face as long as we're in this flesh. He says in verse 22 here, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So this delight in the law of God is the mark of someone who has been born again. Amen. The, the unsaved, the ungodly, they do not like the law of God because it condemns them. It points out that they really are a sinner and they cannot save themselves. And the self-righteous, such as the Pharisees, they, they don't really love the law of God because what they really love is the praise and accolades they get from their outward display of righteousness. That's right. You know, we see that very clearly in the, the, fair, the when the Pharisee and the publican went up to pray, I thank thee God that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, adulterers, or even as this publican. That's the type of thing they love. They don't like right. the actual law of God. There are some that may pretend to like the law of God, but really they are just afraid of the punishment of not keeping it. So there are many who Try to say that Christians, we we only follow the Bible because we're afraid we'll go to hell if we don't. But that's not the reason we delight in the law of God today. The one who has truly been born of God will delight in His law. Now, well, I'm not going to get into what laws are applicable to us today and what's not. We've studied that previously in Romans, but. If you just wanted to boil it down to Ten Commandments, or even just the two greatest commandments that Christ gives us, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and the second is like unto it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. We delight in those things if we're truly been born again. Amen. We rejoice in them, we take satisfaction in them. They shouldn't be burdening some to us. They shouldn't be as First John tells us, grievous. First John five three tells us that here in His love, God will keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Amen. 
John chapter 14, verse 15, Christ plainly says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's right. Yes, if we are saved, we should not use grace as a license to sin. Mm -hmm. Rather, we are to delight in the law of God and follow his commandments. So Solomon says that he meditated in the law of God day and night. So the, the law of God should be our, our guide in this life. It should be what we look to, really, for comfort and for encouragement, for instruction. We shouldn't view the law of God as some rule book that we are we just have to keep. Like it's some burden. If we don't do it, God's gonna get mad at us. The well, one who has truly been born again, that new nature that's within us, it will desire to serve God. Amen. Yeah, that is the problem with a, a works-based type salvation. You're always trying to do good and hoping that you're having no good works. In that sense, his commandments are grievous. They're burdensome, aren't they? They're, mm -hmm. they're like a weight weighing you down. You're always struggling to do enough good. Yet in this flesh, you'll never be able to do enough good. And that's, I think, part of the point what Paul is pointing out to us here is that we, in this flesh, are still wretched. We're still sinful. We still mm -hmm. have a sinful nature to contend with. And as a great of an example as a servant of God as Paul himself was, yet he says he would find himself doing evil when he wanted to do good and right. not doing good when he wants to do it. And yet we should not expect any difference when we try to serve God. He says, I pride the light in the law of God after the inward man. This is that, said that new man, that new creature that has been created in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, for he that is or if we are in Christ, we are a new creature. And all things are passed away, but all things have become new. Mm -hmm. That is, in Christ we're given a new nature. That old man is still present within us, but yet he's made us a new man in Christ. And so we looked at this, I think, in our previous lesson pretty extensively about the new man versus the old man. And that struggle there, but I didn't write it in the notes, but I want to read it for us because it sums up this very well. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, verse 17. Here again, Paul writes for us, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Amen. And that is the, really a summary, if you will, the struggle that we've been talking about, that the flesh and the spirit are contrary one to another, that you can't do what you want to do. And yet, the new man, he desires to serve God, and yet the old man, he desires to serve sin. Right. Which one we feed the most is usually the one that's good. One we're going to let win the fight, if you will. The one mm -hmm. we give the most attention to is the one that is going to prevail in our lives. Verse 23, we'll continue on here. He says, but I see another law in my members. That's not the law of God, but rather a law of sin, if you will, as he calls it later on here. Mm -hmm. He says he sees that in his members or in his body, that's what members is, warring against the law of my mind. Well, these two laws, if you will, the, these two natures, the one desiring to serve sin, the one desiring to serve God, they are warring against one another. Because the word warring implies that they're fighting with the intention to destroy one another. That, that the sinful nature desires to destroy the the new nature that's within us. Amen. The new nature has a, really no, a desire to get rid of that sinful nature that's within us. As Galatians said, they're contrary one to another. They're warring against one another. They're constantly fighting against each other. That is why Christ tells us in the Gospels to pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right. That that spirit or the new man, he is willing to serve God. He desires to serve God, but our flesh is oftentimes prone to sin. Mm -hmm. 
And that is this warring against one another that we see here. It says, in bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. In this body of flesh, we are still, if you will, captive to sin. We are still, in a sense, entangled with sin. And until this body is made perfect, then it will continue to sin. Right. So until we are given that a new body and that we are fully delivered from sin in Christ, then we will, until then, we will experience the struggle with sin. Mm hmm and because the new man has such a desire to serve God, that's why he describes it as a captivity, because he can't freely do what he wants to do. So if you're, I know this is a little bit hard to explain, especially to someone who is not saved, but yet, if you've ever truly tried to serve God, you'll understand what I'm trying to get at here. That, Amen. that the new man, that, that new person in Christ, he has this great desire to serve God, but we can't tell us hindered in the flesh. Amen. That's why he describes it as a, a captivity here, because a new man has no desire for sin. In fact, 1 John tells us that he cannot sin because he was born of God. It's like an, an imprisonment almost to the new man because he can't free himself of that sin yet. As much as we would like to completely rid ourselves of sin in this life, we're not going to until this flesh is perfected. I want us to go on to verse 24, though. Here Paul ex exclaims, O wretched man that I am. Mm -hmm. well, our condition is wretched, it's visible, it's full of sorrows, if you will. You know, it's not that we are relatively good and just need some improvement. We are fully in our sinful nature, wicked and vile in the sight of God. Yet, Amen. yet God was pleased in Christ to save us. That he was pleased to bestow his grace upon us, and yet, even though we still sin against him, and he sees us through the person of Christ, <coughs> though we still in this life sin and fall to temptation, and yet, when we stand before God, he will see us in the person of Christ. And we will be, as Philipp or excuse me, as Ephesians chapter 1 says, accepted in the beloved. Amen. No, don't. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a, you're a pretty good person. That's what the Pharisees thought of themselves. Outside of Christ, we are a most wretched and vile person. Yet in Christ, we can be acceptable inside of God. We can be really righteous in the sight of God. But in ourselves, our righteousness is as good as filthy rags, as David says. O wretched man I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Here, almost in despair, he cries out, Who shall deliver me from this body, or the body of this death? Amen. He, Paul has come to this realization here of his sinfulness that he still has with him, and he has a desire to be delivered from this body. I don't think Paul was wishing death upon himself or anything like that, but he was wishing to just be free from sin. And if we were rightly serving God, I think we should have some level of that same type of desire. We would just be delivered from our sinful state, from this, this flesh that we abide in, that we live in. It is certainly a body of death. It's, we see the effects of sin and death upon it every day. It dies a little more every day when one day it will cease to exist. <coughs> it's really a constant reminder of the sin that remains within us. Between the, the sickness and the pains and the aches and the, the other ailments that it has, it gets older and weaker and feebler. <coughs> it is rightly described as a body of death. Amen. Because it is a point when a man wants to die after this judgment. There you go. But one day, but one day we will be delivered from this. That's what, what Paul he cries out here, who shall deliver me from the body of this day? It's not that we're going to be continuing on forever in this body. It's not if we are saved, at least. If we have truly been born again, we will one day put 
put aside this flesh. We Amen. Put aside the sinful nature that's in us. We will right. Put aside all of those things. And he tells us how in verse 25 he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. It's through Christ that we will be delivered. It's in him when he returns and he gives us a new body. That is when this will be completely fulfilled. Philippians chapter 3 tells us that he will change our vile bodies and the body like unto his glorious body. Amen. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 15 and let's read this. I'm sure it's fairly familiar verses for most of us. First Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 57. Mm -hmm. The whole chapter is discussing the resurrection. Here he tells us about our resurrection, verse 51. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump of the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And one day, for the child of God, we are going to get rid of this corruptible body. And he says, not an incorruptible body. We'll get rid of this mortal body. It's one that is subject to death, and we'll put on a, an immortal one, one that shall live on forever with Christ. You know, first, first Thessalonians 5 says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. We shall, for the rest of eternity, live in that new body that is perfect, that is without sin, that is without even the tiniest drop of sin. It is difficult, I think, to, for us to comprehend that in this mind. We won't need glasses. We won't need Amen. walkers or canes. We won't have any aches or pains. We won't even have even the slightest desire to sin. And yet, it's hard to imagine that in this flesh, isn't it? Right. Yet one day that is coming for the child of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, he gives us the victory over sin and death. Mm -hmm. so in, in the new man, we currently possess that already. But it will be brought to full fruition, if you will, when we, he returns and we are given a new body. And I don't know how all that will transpire. I know, it will, as he says, there will be in the moment a twinkle of an eye. It will be too quick to us even realize what right. exactly occurred. But we do know that when that trump sounds and when dead in Christ rise and if we're still alive, we'll be caught up to meet them. And we will never more have to deal with sin any longer. Amen. Yeah, I know it may. A rough journey for those who have been here through our study in Romans, and chapter 5 and 6 and 7, and talk a lot about our struggles with sin and how we, ought right. to, how we ought to serve God and not serve sin. And we have to be careful not to yield our members as our members of our body, as members of unrighteousness. Rather, we should yield them as instruments to God. Then, in chapter 7, the last several verses, we've seen how that. We try to do good, we don't do it. We don't want to do evil, we find ourselves doing this. Yet this is a great encouragement, I think, for the child of God, that one day we will be delivered from all of that. Amen. That one day we will no longer have to worry about this new man and old man warring against one another within us. Paul comes to this conclusion here in the end of verse 25, back in our text. Because I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, because of all this that we've seen in these last several verses, he says, So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Amen. And with the mind, or the inward man, if you will, the, the new man that is regenerated in Christ, we will serve God. But 
the flesh, this old man, the sin nature that remains within us, it will serve the law of sin. It will right. Continue on serving sin until it is changed. Mm -hmm. With the new man, he will strive to serve God. Because that is the biggest difference between those who have truly been born again and those who have made a false profession. That they, they have no real desire to serve God. That is the difference also between works based salvation and salvation based on grace. Is that Amen. Works, you're always trying to do enough good to outweigh your bad. Yet, by grace, we know that we shall be delivered from sin. Amen. Certainly, we should strive to do our best in our service for God, but we don't have to worry if I did enough good works today or not. Mm -hmm. We just simply trust the finished work of Christ and what He has done. But be sure if you truly try to serve God, you will face a struggle in this flesh. You're right. But don't be discouraged. One day we will be, we will be delivered from all that. The Lord will next week we'll begin chapter 8. Which if I had to pick a favorite chapter of the Bible, it would probably be Romans chapter 8. Yep. There's so much good in it. Amen. We'll, well, we'll close with that thought. Thank you. Amen.